Hi everyone, and if I look like I'm exhausted, it's because I am. Um, but we promised to update you on our lawsuit against Calgary Expo and the Mary Sue, and we finally have enough things to actually report to be able to put them all in one place for you. So, without further ado, here we go. Now the first thing I have to get out of the way is uh, the fact that everything I'm going to say from this point onward is a matter of public record. Uh, it exists in sworn affidavits or defense exhibits or uh, plaintiff exhibits, the, the plaintiff statement of claim. These are all matters of public record. So essentially we're suing both Calgary Expo and the Mary Sue for, among other things, injurious falsehood. Injurious falsehood is not the same thing as defamation. Uh, injurious falsehood is a lie spoken with malice that damages someone's ability to carry on business or causes them a financial loss relating to their property or business. Malice in this case includes, but is not limited to, making a false statement, knowing it was false and knowing it would cause harm, or making a false statement knowing it would cause harm and without taking proper care to verify that the statement was true. You don't even really need to prove that they made the statement for the specific purpose or goal of causing that harm in order to prove malice in a case of injurious falsehood, though that certainly helps. You can prove malice just through recklessness alone. Now, the difference in terms of uh, what constitutes malice, right? What, what is the colloquial um, definition of malice and the legal definition in this case is kind of like the difference between these two statements. I lied because I wanted to cause damage to him. That is what's colloquially understood as malice. Um, or... Uh, I lied for some other reason, despite the fact that I knew it would cause damage to him. That is also considered to be malice in a case of injurious falsehood. One of the other things, too, in terms of taking proper care to check, right? Um, or taking proper care to verify uh, recklessness, is that in the case of the Mary Sue, at the very least, um, they completely ignored uh, common, common industry standard due diligence in that they did not reach out to us for comment prior to press time. Um, in fact, they have never reached out to us for comment, um, even after publishing their article. And uh, so essentially, uh, a lot of what they published in their article, they would have discovered was false if they had actually reached out to us for comment, we would have presented them with the evidence and they would have been unable to publish that. So, um, there you go. Injurious falsehood is different from defamation in that defamation re relates to a person's right to not have their character wrongfully disparaged. Uh, it's about their esteem in the eyes of others as a human being, right? Injurious falsehood isn't so much about character, it's about wrongfully disparaging someone's property, business, products, or other attributes um, in such a way that causes them financial harm. So, as an example, I'm going to use one of the funniest fake Yelp reviews uh, that was made on Laughing Witch's tub refinishing business after she, uh, she went after Thunderfoot and uh, called down the wrath of the internet upon her. Okay, so... Uh, this, this review, which had me just laughing my ass off, I hired this company to refinish my tub, but all they did was paint swastikas all over the bathroom. That would be injurious falsehood. That is a, a disparagement of the business or the service, the, the financial transaction, the, yeah, all of that, not the character, right? But the actual product that is being sold. Um, and, uh, and then we have, uh, plain defamation, strict defamation, which is defamation of character. The owners of this company are neo-Nazis and they enjoy torturing kittens. Has nothing to do with their ability to carry on a business, um, in any kind of fair and just and, uh, and reasonable manner. It just means that they're neo-Nazis and enjoy torturing kittens. So that is 
defamation of character. And it may also be injurious falsehood depending on whether you can prove that uh, it lost you business. Now, I'm probably not getting all the subtleties of this particular tort exactly right, because I am not a lawyer, but this is kind of basically what the difference is about. You intentionally lie about someone's business or property or products knowing it will cause them financial harm. Or you tell a falsehood in that vein that you know will cause them harm because you didn't take proper care to check to verify that what you were saying was true. And of course, if you can prove that the person didn't like you, right, and that's why they did it, then that actually adds to the uh, argument of malice. So anyway, Allison filed this lawsuit in the summer of 2015, and like everything legal, it takes for fucking ever. Here we are a year and a half later, we've got a pre-trial conference, I think it's the third one, scheduled for tomorrow, and hopefully uh, after that conference we will still have a trial date in January. So it's been more than a year and a half, and uh, from when Calgary Expo expelled us, evicted us from their event, and, uh, and we're just getting to the point where, you know, the final pre-trial conference is scheduled, and ready to go and the, we have a trial date and, and it's all maybe gonna fucking result in something. Basically we are alleging that Calgary Expo and the Mary Sue disseminated false statements about Allison relating to her role with the Honey Badgers and that these false statements led to Calgary Expo breaching their contract with Allison and kicking her and the rest of us out and banning her from future conventions operated by Calgary Expo in Edmonton, Saskatoon, and Calgary. This, of course, makes it impossible for Allison to sell her comics and other stuff at the largest comic cons in Western Canada, and that harms her financially. And it also means that when it comes right down to it, Honey Badger Brigade has also essentially been blacklisted. Now the two false statements we're focusing on are the allegations published by the Mary Sue that Allison engaged in harassment at the Women Into Comics panel and that she infiltrated the convention by misrepresenting who she was on her booth rental application, which would constitute fraud and a breach of contract. Now keep in mind uh, the reasoning behind throwing us out over this fraud and breach of contract on Allison's part, um, alleged, alleged fraud and breach of contract, is that um, she did not represent herself as a honey badger. Uh, she did not represent herself as being um, applying to rent a booth at the convention um, in order to represent the honey badger brigade. So this is what they are alleging. This is what they are holding out as the reason why she was ejected. She misrepresented herself on her booth application. Now, on November 28th, the defendants formally requested the court to summarily dismiss the case. This is basically just asking a judge to make a ruling that the plaintiff doesn't actually have a case at all here whatsoever, and so there's no reason to even bother with the trial. This is pretty standard, um, it's, a, it's like a typical tactic, and, and you can pretty much expect it in any single uh, civil suit, uh, any single lawsuit, any single tort, right? But it usually happens right at the beginning of a case, you know, sometimes before there's even a trial date. Um, when it happens really last minute like this, it's usually just obstructionism. The pre-trial hearing had already been scheduled for tomorrow and they filed these these affidavits and these uh, requests for summary dismissal just two weeks before that with the intention of reading the affidavits filed and making the request for summary dismissal at the hearing. Now Allison has had to scramble to write her own affidavit in response and to have it sworn and then to get it, it served to the court on time, and we still don't know um, whether that affidavit will actually make it on time to the court. 
and uh, we can argue that they left us very very little time to respond and uh, see if, if that doesn't if that if it doesn't get filed in time and see if that helps us out if the judge is going to be uh, forgiving over us being unable to file our response in time but um, we'll we'll see we'll you never know in support of their applications the defendants provided two affidavits one from the Mary Sue sworn on the 23rd of November and one from Shane Henkelman who was the person who personally gave us the boot from the convention and that was sworn on November 1st and uh, I'm figuring that they worked on this uh, the Mary Sue and Calgary Expo worked on this together for about a month before they actually took the product, right? The affidavit sworn by Dave, uh, Shane Henkelman and, uh, and turned it into an application, a uh, dual application for summary dismissal. And I know that they have been collaborating on it because the assertions made in the affidavits are profoundly similar. And uh, that similarity is even down to identical wording for entire paragraphs. So some of these paragraphs in these affidavits one uh, from Shane Henkelman um, and the other from Andrew Ice, Icebrow, um are absolutely 100% identical. For instance, in the affidavit from the Mary Sue, it is stated, Honey Badger Brigade has been known to support the controversial Gamergate movement, which is notorious for harassing feminist gamers. And the plaintiff was clearly attending the Calgary Expo in her role as co-founder of the Honey Badger Brigade. The Calgary Expo had no idea that she would appear on behalf of Honey Badger Brigade since she misrepresented her application for a booth by using her own personal website. The affidavit from Calgary Expo contains the following paragraph. Honey Badger Brigade has been known to support the controversial Gamergate movement, which is notorious for harassing feminist gamers. And the plaintiff was clearly attending the Calgary Expo in her role as co-founder of the Honey Badger Brigade. The Calgary Expo had no idea that she would appear on behalf of Honey Badger Brigade since she misrepresented her application for a booth by using her own personal website. Creepily similar? No? Anyway, the claim that we infiltrated the convention under false pretenses comes from this. And hilariously, Calgary Expo and the Mary Sue entered into evidence some exhibits to support the claims made in the two affidavits. This one is from Calgary Expo. And of course, the affidavit supporting the Mary Sue claims that this comment... We're in stealth mode due to concerns about, ahem, people of a certain persuasion deciding to hassle the con organizers over having us space lepers at the show. End quote. That this made it reasonable for this defendant to state that the plaintiff in stealth mode procured a booth under false pretenses. Um, no. At best, it could be argued that Allison wanted to remain low-key in the public sense to prevent the convention organizers from being harassed. It doesn't indicate anything about her lying to Calgary Expo about who she was or what she intended to do. But oh my goodness, here's what Shane Henkelman had to say in his affidavit supporting Calgary Expo. The plaintiff admitted to procuring a booth at Calgary Expo under false pretenses on the Honey Badger Brigade's own crowdfunding page, which stated, We're in stealth mode due to concerns about, ahem, people of a certain persuasion deciding to hassle the con organizers over having us space lepers at the show. This statement made it reasonable for Calgary Expo to evict the plaintiff from the events as she admitted that she was in stealth mode, thereby procuring a booth under false pretenses contrary to the exhibitor policies. He goes on to say, The plaintiff also procured a booth at the Calgary Expo event by lying about who she actually represented and the contents of her booth, also which violated exhibitor policies. Now, while... 
it is possible that the Mary Sue could possibly be forgiven for jumping to this conclusion. The hilarious thing about this statement coming from Shane Henkelman on behalf of Calgary Expo is that he is committing injurious falsehood in his affidavit as part of their own defense exhibits submitted by them. We have the application form Allison filled out to rent a booth, clearly listing her website as honeybadgerbrigade.com and her email as honeybadgersradio at gmail.com. So these guys took a random sarcastic comment in a comment section as a literal confession of fraud, and yet somehow that satirical statement and others on a crowdfunder that described us as carefully crafting personas of nerdiness with the sole purpose of infiltrating a convention that didn't exist when we launched our diabolical plan to infiltrate it, linked to a website that describes me as a time-traveling nuclear arms dealer with a bionic liver who once smuggled plutonium in her bra and then traveled back in time to possess the body of Ada Lovelace. This is more reasonable. This is a more reasonable thing to base their assessment of the facts on than their own booth application form that they had access to. Their own booth application form that they themselves submitted as evidence. Seriously. In the affidavit supporting them, it is claimed that Allison wrongfully concealed her identity as a honey badger in her application for a booth. And then they enter into evidence the application form that clearly identifies her as a honey badger. You could not make this shit up, people. We just had no idea Allison would be attending on behalf of the Honey Badger Brigade. I mean, there was the Honey Badger application for a booth linking to the Honey Badger website and the Honey Badger emails that were exchanged, and then there were the booth materials we printed out for them, including a Honey Badger booth decal and a half dozen Honey Badger exhibitor badges, but we just had no idea she would be there representing the Honey Badgers. And see, we can prove it because of this one sardonic comment she made that doesn't even really suggest she deceived us, but at most suggests she was trying to maintain a low profile publicly so as not to cause us any trouble or hassle. Oh, and did we mention that she came to the convention for the sole purpose of harassing people? Because apparently that's what people who want to maintain a low pu public profile do. Also, they admitted, she admitted to her entire group being space lepers. And we at Calgary Expo, while not sure whether this means they're aliens suffering from earth leprosy or earthlings suffering a form of leprosy that is extraterrestrial in origin or aliens suffering from alien leprosy, Whatever the case, it sounds nasty and contagious, and of course, we work diligently to provide a safe, fun, and inclusive event for absolutely everyone. Out with the space lepers! Mr. Henkelman goes on to claim that the Honey Badger Brigade, not just Allison, mind you, caused a disturbance. Disturbance. During the Women Into Comics panel, and then he goes on to claim that there is video evidence of this disturbance that he has seen. Now, anyone familiar with this case knows there's video footage of the entire panel discussion. As far as I know, all of the panel discussions at Calgary Expo were filmed, and lots of them have been uploaded to YouTube. But oddly enough, this one has not. And somehow, for some strange, inexplicable reason, Calgary Expo did not enter that video footage of the panel into evidence. So let me make this really clear. Calgary Expo is being sued for tens of thousands of dollars. One of their agents claims under oath that there is video footage exonerating the Expo, showing that Allison and others, other honey badgers caused a disturbance at a panel discussion in violation of the rules and policies of the convention. 
They use that as their justification for having kicked us out. Calgary Expo was subjected to massive amounts of public criticism on social media for ejecting us, and they are now subject to a legal action that has already cost them thousands of dollars and stretched on for a year and a half, and which could, in the end, cost them tens if not hundreds of thousands of dollars if our legal costs are assigned to Calgary Expo. And not only have they not made that video footage public, that exonerating video footage public, they haven't even entered into evidence. They claim video footage of a panel discussion exists, and I would suggest that this footage does indeed exist, since most or all of the panels were recorded, and I know there were cameras set up from eyewitness testimony. I know there were cameras set up at the Women in Comics panel. Now, I don't know about you, but I personally would love to see that footage. I think the public would really benefit from seeing that footage. And I think any fair and reasonable judge would also be very interested in seeing that footage. So I really have to wonder why Calgary Expo has not made that footage public or entered it into evidence for use at trial. What I do know is that we submitted into evidence our audio recording of the panel discussion. Both defendants have essentially argued against a mountain of contrary evidence that the owner of Honey Badger Brigade willfully misrepresented herself while acting in her capacity as owner of Honey Badger Brigade. They have accused her of doing so in order to gain entry for Honey Badger Brigade to the convention because Honey Badger Brigade's business practices include harassing panelists and causing disruptions. The entirety of their justifications for our eviction revolve around the business Honey Badger Brigade who support the controversial Gamergate movement. Yada, yada, yada. Another claim made by Mr. Hinkleman is that we are suing the wrong party. That is, we named the wrong company in our suit, which is indeed something we did so more than once. We originally obtained the name Calgary Expo International, Inc. from a federal business directory search of companies owned by Kendrick's Fung. We identified Fung through a search for the registered owner of the official Calgary Expo website, and then further Google searches of phone directories turned up exactly one person by that name in all of North America who happened to be residing in Calgary, and numerous mainstream media articles naming him as the founder of Calgary Expo. So we have the right guy. We have one uniquely named guy who is the much publicized founder of Calgary Expo who owns their official website. We did a business directory search and found a corporation called Calgary Expo International Inc. and reasonably assumed that this was the business entity attached to Calgary Expo. And then they informed us that they have nothing to do with Calgary Expo and, uh, and that we were suing the wrong party. And they presented this as if they were some innocent, similarly named company, you know, like McDonald's hot dogs that was mistakenly, accidentally named in a lawsuit that really has nothing to do with them whatsoever. So then we went with the business name attached to the PayPal receipt for the booth rental, which was Comic and Entertainment Expo Committee. We were informed thereafter that this also was not the appropriate party to name in the lawsuit. So then we sent the law firm that coincidentally represented both of these legal entities a letter asking for the correct name. And they sent us a reply saying, our notice speaks for itself and didn't supply the name. So finally, months later, we get to the second pretrial hearing at which point legal counsel for Calgary Expo, you know, who also happens to be the legal counsel for the other two parties mistakenly named in the lawsuit, 
finally informs us that the proper entity to name in the lawsuit is actually Alberta Entertainment Expo, Inc. And then a week or so later, uh, they send us a letter saying, whoops, we done fucked up. The actual operator of Calgary Expo is Calgary Comic and Entertainment Expo, Inc. So, literally, this asshole's own lawyer didn't know what company he was supposed to be representing at the hearing. And the funny thing about this is that the free online search of federally registered companies spits out Calgary Expo International, Inc. to identify all the other similarly named companies owned by Kendricks Fung and registered in Alberta, you would have to schlep yourself to a registry office and pay a government agent to do a search. Now, that strikes me as intentionally trying to hide who you really are by putting out some kind of great bait mate on a free online search and then you're able to say, oh, yeah, no, Calgary, Calgary Expo International Inc. didn't do nothing. So I'm actually half expecting tomorrow to hear from Calgary Expo's lawyer that we've yet again named the wrong defendant and demanding a summary dismissal because we just couldn't get our shit together and figure out which of this guy's half dozen shady shell corporations is actually responsible for putting on the Expo. Another of the assertions in the affidavits is that injurious falsehood is the same as defamation and that the Provincial Court of Alberta does not have jurisdiction to adjudicate defamation claims. However, claims of injurious falsehood, while they can be interchangeable with claims of defamation, are not always thus. So, say I'm trying to sell a piece of land and I'm in negotiations with someone who wants to buy it. Some other guy who hates me goes to the buyer and falsely tells him, well, this guy doesn't realize it, but the property has a patch of contaminated soil on it that will need cleaning up. The buyer then backs out of the sale. That's not defamation of character. The guy isn't saying I'm bad or even that I'm dishonest. He's falsely saying there's something wrong with my property. Again, this is the difference between saying Laughing Witch and her husband are neo-Nazis who torture kittens and saying that when you hire their company to refinish your tub, they paint swastikas all over your bathroom instead. They are saying we are bad people. Yes, that's defamation of character. But Allison is also running a bad business enterprise, an enterprise whose operators and agents commit fraud and attend events for the purpose of disrupting them and committing harassment and who breach contracts. That's injurious falsehood. Anyhow, we will keep you posted as to what ends up happening in the courtroom tomorrow. That's That'll be Friday the 16th, and um, we're planning to do a stream, hopefully Friday evening, to uh, sort of talk about what, what went on and uh, what the decision was of the judge in regard to these two applications for summary dismissal. And... Uh, We'll also be letting you know what you can do in order to help get uh, public eyes on this case now that it's actually approaching a trial date. Um, it's very, very hard to maintain uh, public interest in something like this over the course of, you know, 18 or 20 months, which is what, what this has been, an 18 or 20 month journey um, through the legal system. But now that the court date is approaching and it is less than one month away, um, we will have some suggestions as to how you can help um, signal boost this and, uh, and essentially let the court system itself know that there are eyes watching. And uh, that will help ensure that we're treated fairly. So hopefully I will, we will be having good news to tell you tomorrow in the evening and uh hopefully i'll also have a real video with you know nicer content out soon all right that's it for me bye <laughs>
Thank you.